Hello, and welcome to Good Samaritan University. My name is Rita Ferretti. I'm the lactation coordinator and the committee chair of the Baby Friendly Task Force. I'm here to speak to you today about Good, Samaritan's, um, Good Samaritan Hospital's journey to achieving baby friendly designation. I just want to say that I have no, um, nothing to disclose. Okay. In today's agenda, we're going to talk about what the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative is, why Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative is important, the pathway to prepare our hospital for an on-site assessment to receive designation, and how we transform the workplace culture for sustainable change um, with new practices. So what is the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative? Um, so the, um, the World Health Organization and the United Nations Children's Fund launched the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, which is a global program to encourage the broad scale implementation of the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding and the International Code of Marketing Breast Milk Substitutes. I'll be describing in the program um, later on um, what those documents mean. The WHO and UNICEF administer the BFHI program internationally to work with the national authority in each country which confers to baby friendly designation in their nation. More than 20,000 maternity facilities in 150 countries around the world earned the baby friendly designation. In the United States, over 1 million babies are born each year in 590 baby friendly facilities, which equates to about 28% uh, 20 of annual births. Okay, I, just to describe the philosophy of Baby Friendly USA, um, it, it, the core of, these, of this philosophy stems from that there is an abundance of scientific evidence which concludes that mothers and babies who breastfeed experience improved health outcomes and lower risk of certain diseases. Breastfeeding is a natural biological conclusion to pregnancy and an important mechanism in the natural development of an infant. Hospitals and birthing centers wield enormous influence over the first days of life and play a critical role in determining breastfeeding success. Before the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative began to take hold across the U.S., commercial interests significantly influenced infant feeding practices in ways that undermined breastfeeding. Baby-friendly facilities are centers of support in which evidence-based care is provided. Education is free from commercial interests, and all infant feeding options are possible, and individu individual preferences are respected. The aim is to ensure that every mother is fully informed of the importance of breastfeeding and to help um, her with the assistance she needs to achieve her breastfeeding goal. It's respected that breastfeeding is not possible for some families in certain situations, and suppl supplementation of formula is sometimes medically needed. Um, so the, the idea is that every mother has the right to evidence-based information free from commercial interests to help her decide how her baby should be fed and that she's equally supported and treated with dignity and respect for her infant feeding decision. So the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding are the broad framework that guide the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. They were developed by a team of global experts and have been studied, each one of these steps, to conclude that when we follow these 10 steps, um, we are supporting a mother for um, exclusive breastfeeding and a long duration of breastfeeding. Um, so Healthcare um, professionals sometimes um, don't get enough training for breastfeeding, and they'll go by their own experience in offering um, education and support to mothers when um, the emphasis really should be for training direct staff and um, providers for breastfeeding. And I just want to say that um, the 10 steps of, um, to successful breastfeeding really are at the core of multiple breastfeeding policies within the mater maternal child um, department and throughout the hospital. Another important document BFHI upholds um, in their standards for care is the International Code of Marketing Breast Milk Substitutes. What this code states is that 
all patients should receive information about their infant feedings free of commercial interests and that um, we do not deliver free samples to patients uh, um, acting as a liaison between us and the formula companies. Um, years ago, we used to um, give every patient a diaper bag that was filled with formula and nipples. And in effect, we were becoming a uh, representative of the formula company. So why is the code important? Uh, for both healthcare workers, and why could um, um, not utilizing this code create potential harm for both patients and healthcare workers? So, associating the name with Good Samaritan Hospital with a company implies that the facility endorsement of that company or its products are being promoted by Good Samaritan Hospital. This may unintentionally sway health professionals to recommend products to patients that are not specific to the patient's needs. Receipt of meals or free registration to meetings creates a potential obligation to favor that company's products over other products. Receipt of awards or gifts by a vendor associates a company's name with a respected staff member, setting that staff member up as a role model for others. Uh, this may imply that that staff member's endorsement of a product or company um, is um, there as a representative and that it could influence other um, coworkers. Now um, I'm going to discuss why the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative is important. So in 2011, the Surgeon General made a call to action to support breastfeeding due to the overwhelming um, positive health outcomes, breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding um, results for um, infants and mothers. And part of um, this call to action was to ensure that maternity care practices throughout the United States are fully supportive of breastfeeding. And in this call to action, they're basically speaking to the 10 steps of breastfeeding as well as other, um, other changes within society and the community to support mothers to breastfeed, such as um, providing breaks um, for mothers at work to be able to pump during their work day and um, family leave um, there and breast pumps issued to mothers covered under their um, health plan just to name a few the Joint Commission is also um, another uh, governing body that in 2014 applied the perinatal core measure set. And within that core measure set, they named exclusive breast milk feeding. Um, so this is a reportable, um, this is reportable data that we in Good Samaritan Hospital are obligated to report to the Joint Commission. <clears throat> um, this, the perinatal, perinatal core measure set is uh, instituted to hospitals with over 1,100 deliveries per year. And here at Good Sam, we have approximately 3,000 deliveries. In this core measure set, we are reporting babies that fed exclusive breast milk, any breast milk, <clears throat> and formula only. So even one feeding of formula um, diminishes the data for exclusivity and it adds to babies who received any milk. Um, and um, so an exclusion criteria to this measure are babies that are admitted to the NICU or uh, if the mother delivered multiples like twins or triplets. And um, these entities have made these calls to action and made it requirements to report um, exclusivity because we know about the benefits of breastfeeding. There's abundant research demonstrating that breastfeeding is the best source of infant nutrition. And the health benefits have been proven for both the mother and baby to reduce comorbidities and reduce healthcare costs. The American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecology, and the Association of Women's Health Obstetric and Neonatal Nurses have long supported breastfeeding and recommend that all infants, with rare exceptions, be exclusively breastfed for six months and continue breastfeeding with appropriate complementary foods until mutually desired by the mother and her baby. Exclusive breastfeeding, as I've said before, means the baby has received nothing but breast milk not even water. And that at six months, they um, begin complementary foods. Now, um, a really important um, article was just published by the American Academy of Pediatrics calling for more support for breastfeeding mothers to continue breastfeeding beyond the first year. And um, the updates include a recommendation to support parents 
who choose to go to two years. Um, not everyone can breastfeed or continue to breastfeed for as long as desired for various reasons, but families deserve non-judgmental support, information, and help to guide them in feeding their infant. And so the recommendation is that breastfeeding continues until mutually uh, desired by the mother and the baby. And in our country, to breastfeed a baby beyond a year could look strange. So it's important that um, the AAP issue this statement to help um, form measures to support women who want to feed longer. Now, um, in, uh, on Long Island, um, there are only two facilities that are currently baby friendly. Um, and um, in the United States overall, over one million babies are born each year in 590 uh, baby-friendly facilities, which is about 28% of annual births. So our sister hospital, St. Catherine of Siena, they received this designation in 2018. Our goal at Good Samaritan is to join our sister hospital and go through our uh, work plan to receive designation by early 2024. And now I'd like to describe how we're going through this pathway to receive designation. Um, so this is just a diagram of the pathway. It's a four step process and each step generally takes a year because you can see in the pathway, there's quite a bit of work to do. I can proudly announce that we are now in the third phase uh, dissemination where we will be um, training staff shortly on uh, the 10 steps, how to support a mother. Um, we're going to be um, obtaining data collection on various um, aspects of the 10 steps. And data collection is really important here because when you collect data, it identifies uh, gaps in care and where we can make improvement. And um, our plan is to continue data collection beyond receiving designation because our healthcare system is an ever-changing entity. And we may find that over time where we were doing great in one area, we need to look at it again and um, make an action plan for improvement again. So you can see this pathway is going to take some work. So the Baby Friendly Task Force delegated tasks by breaking up in six subcommittees. And each of these um, subcommittees have their own work to do. And um, they're, um, they're assigned with certain tasks, and then we meet once a month as a complete baby-friendly task force. And often these different subcommittees have to intermingle with each other to complete work. But um, we're, uh, we're, we're, the tasks that we are working on have been defined to us by the baby-friendly uh, guidelines and criteria. And um, we're, you know, in the data collection, we're looking at how does Good Samaritan feed <clears throat> our babies when we're um, comparing it to what's happening on a national level and where we are in achieving Healthy People 2020 goals and objectives. So in um, any a newborn receiving any breast milk, for example, um, the Healthy People target was about 82%. And in the United States for 2018, the data showed we surpassed that. And we do very good at Good Samaritan in providing any breast milk feeding for the newborn. We've exceeded the 2020 goals. 15% of our babies are formula fed and about 31% of our babies are exclusively fed. Now, uh, we don't have data for the rest of these metrics because this isn't anything we follow um, at this moment. But one thing we need to look at is when mothers come in to the hospital for their delivery, one of the intake questions we ask them is, what is your feeding intention for your baby? Exclusive, exclusive breastfeeding, breastfeeding with supplementation, or formula only? And month after month, 50% of our mothers state they want to exclusively breastfeed. So uh, I think we have some um, improvement to make um, because 31% does show a gap in um, reaching the mother's goal. So we'll be looking at the data to see where we could fine tune things to help mothers reach their goal. Now, in our data, we've been guided by Baby Friendly to look at 
how do babies feed based on race and ethnicity? And um, the CDC has been way ahead of this. They've been reporting disparities in breastfeeding for many, many years now. And the data indicates that in the black population, babies are um, with receiving any breast milk um, fall below what white babies receive and Hispanic babies receive. So we um, have been taking a deep dive at Good Samaritan to look at our own data. And this is from 2021. Um, we had about uh, 2,900 deliveries. And the data demonstrates that in the white population, about 57% of women exclusively breastfeed, while 50% get any breast milk. And when you compare it to the black population, 9% exclusively breastfeed, with 14% getting any breast milk. In the Hispanic population, 24% exclusively breastfeed, with 28% getting any breast milk. Um, and it's even broken down um, to black Hispanic and white Hispanic. And even when you're, you're breaking it down that way, the black community is still demonstrating a lower percentage rate of any breastfeeding or exclusive breastfeeding. So we need to look at what we can do um, to change this as well. And it's, it's going to take time, but we're um, looking at our policies so that um, our policies are reflective of the diverse population we serve, that we're including everybody in the population and that we're recognizing we do have a diverse population and that our care shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all type of care and we need to be aware of our practice and avoid providing care that varies in quality because of personal characteristics such as uh, gender, ethnicity, geographic location, and socioeconomic status of our patients. So how do you make all these changes, transform workplace culture, and sustain that change? So as I said before, we're going to start with education for direct care staff and providers. And we have many mechanisms in here, um, at Good Samaritan to provide this education. We have the Catholic Health Academy and the ABCs of breastfeeding and the Symphony Breast Pump Use are on there. Um, and that's just a couple of um, in services that are available in Catholic Health. Um, I want to speak to the Empower Best Practices um, program. Our maternal child uh, department applied for a grant that was offered by the CDC, and we were one of 50 hospitals in the nation to be awarded this grant. And it's been an incredible experience in how they're guiding us to look at equity and care, look at our data, look at our practices. We were um, given with this grant, an e-learning module that will be um, uh, uploaded to Catholic Health and available to our staff shortly. And the e-learning is going to be um, followed by an in-person skills training. So th this, um, this has been such a great experience for us because it's brought engagement to the um, staff of the Maternal Child Health Department. The system is that we are being trained by this Empower program, and our staff will then become the trainers. So it's a train the trainer kind of system, which offers a lot of engagement. And we're already starting to see some improvements to our skin to skin and our um, overall breastfeeding rate. And I just wanted to share, there are outside webinars available, and some of them are free. And at this time, the University of Albany School of Public Health is offering a free four-part webinar series um, called Supporting and Promoting Breastfeeding, Chest Feeding, and Lactation in Healthcare Settings. And it, this program is inclusive of um, chest feeding because not everybody is comfortable with the term breastfeeding. So we're recognizing that and uh, trying to change our language to be more inclusive. So I just wanted to um, talk about breastfeeding policies at Good Sam because breastfeeding isn't just about the maternal child department. Women come back to the hospital for procedures or they need surgery. So um, our imaging services department does have a policy for the administration of IV contrast when breastfeeding to guide the um, to guide our staff about what medications are still safe um, for the breastfeeding mother. Um, is there a period where she may need to pump and dump um, her breast milk? 
before um, an IV contrast is out of her system and resume breastfeeding. There are many instances, for example, where mothers receive medications and there's no need to disrupt breastfeeding at all. Um, now, in the nursing manuals, we are retiring our breastfeeding basics policy, um, and a new policy is coming soon called the infant feeding policy, because we wanted to make our language um, more inclusive of infants who are formula feeding, because formula feeding does take education as well in uh, teaching parents how to safely prepare formula and how to feed babies formula in an appropriate manner. The breastfeeding admitted or readmitted patients policy, again, that's for patient mothers, uh, um, breastfeeding mothers or infants who are breastfeeding, readmitted to the hospital to guide staff outside of maternal child uh, with knowledge about how to support continued infant feeding. Um, the breastfeeding collection and storage policy, that's for the NICU. Our refrigerator in the NICU and our freezer is filled with mother's express breast milk. And we also have a donor milk, um, a pasteurized human donor milk policy here as well. The NICU offers donor milk to um, babies whose mothers are just a little delayed in their milk production. Um, and then the breastfeeding formula supplementation policy is for babies who need medical uh, formula supplementation or mothers just make an informed decision that they're going to go ahead and give their baby some formula along with the breast milk. So transformation and sustainable change really takes a team and it's multidisciplinary. So the important thing to do is to first describe why the change is important and needed and then engage leadership for support. You build a task force that's um, based, uh, that comes from disciplines from throughout the hospital. Um, then your data will identify gaps in care so that you could initiate performance improvement and come up with an action plan to remove the barriers. And then it's so important to, to continue the data. Just because you achieve a great goal doesn't mean you're done. You have to always look at your process, your workflow, and um, be sure that the data is still demonstrating good numbers. And it's important to disseminate the information to the staff. When we do that in huddles, um, committee meetings, in emails, and even this presentation. And it's so important to recognize and celebrate achievements because we really do some great work here at Good Samaritan Hospital. I can't tell you how proud I am to be a part of this team. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I can be reached at Lactation Services at 631-376-3901. And I'd like to thank you for joining me today.